questions? Um, first of all, I just want to say, I was just looking out there for a question from our friend Terry Bay, and somehow I lost it when I refreshed my feed a few minutes ago when my computer froze. Um, somehow I lost your question, Terry. I'm so sorry. If you want to repost your question, um, please do so. Um, but I cannot find it. I, for some reason, it won't let me um, go back up in the comments um, when I'm in the live feed. Um, but we do have a couple of more questions coming in. We have some comments. Um, Barry uh, Get said that she just saw that plate today because she's in Vegas, which is yeah. kind of fascinating that you're showing these and she's there and she just saw this stuff. Um, and then um, Michael Brady um, of Ocean Liner Designs. Um, he's a friend of ours in Australia um, that Kipfer and I just talked to uh, recently. He does these beautiful Ocean Liner illustrations. Um, he, um, he says hello and he has a question that we'll get back to in a few minutes. David Gallo says, I always enjoy talking with Bill and we often speak for an hour or more. The depth of his knowledge and his boundless curiosity amazes me. As much information as he is sharing tonight is just the tip of the iceberg. That sounds foreboding, Dave. Thank you. <laughs> Steve Hall, Steve Hall um, author of many books, including um, Titanic, The Ship Magnificent. He says, listening in with a glass of 12-year-old scotch, love the beard, Bill. <laughs> yeah, and it's cootie free. <laughs> Good to know. Um, <laughs> well, I was being mistaken for cousin it too many times. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, anyway, um, Anthony L. Um, Corari, Anthony, please forgive me if I did not say your last name right. I'm terrible at this. Um, let's see. I love to see Daniel's uncovered image of the Cafe Parisian. Utilizing the gold Greek key China. Very interesting. Um, so I just wanted to read the comments first. Um, and then we'll backtrack and get some of the questions. Before we do, and I'm not ignoring him. Um, our admin team member, Jorge Martinez, joined us just recently from, um, from Chile. And he has a couple of questions for you. So I'm going to let Jorge unmute himself and ask his questions really quickly because I'm not ignoring him and he does have a couple of questions that he's been holding on to very patiently. Go for it, Jorge. <laughs> Jorge, before you start, I want to make a suggestion. I need to take a break. I'm going to suggest that you talk amongst yourselves and I'll be back in about three minutes. Oh, we can do that. Okay, go ahead. Bill is going to take a break. <laughs> Um, so while we're looking at um, a picture of the big piece here, guys, um, I um, let's talk about artifacts. Um, there are lots of books out there that have pictures of artifacts in them, but um, I just want to say this book is by far the best book of out there about artifacts and it's in French. So I can't read it unless I get Google Translate out there. But if you ever have an opportunity to get a hold of this book, um, do so. It's fantastic. It's about the recovery um, efforts in 1987, um, it's about what happened to the artifacts when they were first recovered, um, the preservation process, what worked and what didn't. Um, they went to a lab in France, um, just right after the recovery. It's just absolutely fascinating. Um, and then um, I have some actual artifacts as I'm sure many of you do. Here's a little piece of Titanic coal in my little ship's wheel. Um, that's something I bought recently. This, because I'm a big nerd, I've had since the mid nineties. I don't know if you guys can see that. It's a little piece of coal. I know I'm not the only one that has it. Having a little acrylic box. Do you guys have that, Kipfer, Jorge? What? I know Eric has one, don't you, oh, Eric? Did, yeah, you do. Titanic hole? No. Yeah, in the little box, in the little oh, bag that says Titanic hole. 
and has the little certificate of authenticity that has the printed signatures of um, P.H. Narjale and um, George Tulloch. Um, it says it's from the um, 1994 expedition. But um, I don't know, those are just my little artifacts. I have a little tiny piece of rust from the big piece. Not Titanic related, but I have an SH United States uh, piece I got from a friend of mine. Oh, yeah. Um, who says I have that one as well? I'm just seeing like my, it's so weird when I'm doing a live feed, you guys, the comments pop up and they're out of order. Greg Ellis says he has that one as well. What the coal, the one in the little bag that says Titanic coal. Do you know how bad I've wanted to open that and touch it? Oh my goodness. And all these years, like I think I've had it since 96 or 90, 95 or 96, all these years, I have not touched it. Not open the bag. See? The legacy collection rust. Uh, I don't know if it's a legacy collection rest. It is from White Star Memories, so. though. Um, but no, it's not necessarily oh, the legacy collection. But it is from the um, the big piece. It's a little piece of rust, rusticle from the big piece, from White Star Memories. Um, Bill is back. Um, so we're going to let Jorge ask a couple of questions and then we're going to go uh, back to um, back to the um, member questions. I think we need to backtrack to the one from um, Michael Brady. Go ahead, Jorge. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening, Bill. Let me tell you, this is uh, uh, I'm very excited about this, this live because uh, a few years ago, I worked for a cruise line, Celebrity Cruises, as a, wait, as a waiter. So I know exactly what you're talking about when you miss China, the main courses, the, all the instructions that the, they have to carry out in the dining room and the salad satellite uh, uh, restaurants. So I, want to, I wanted to say that first, and I have two questions. Uh, if I want to buy uh, any available artifacts on the market, like China, for instance, what do you think I should be aware of to know if that piece is fake or real? Uh, you're asking about purchasing Titanic, China from Titanic? Yes, or Olympic class. Oh, they're, they're two different things. All right. Because what happens is the Titanic artifacts are controlled by a U.S. court. And so just theoretically, you're not supposed to have them. So oh, purchasing no. them might be a violation of U.S. law. I'm not a lawyer, and I cannot give legal information. That is simply my understanding of the situation. Now, in the right. case of Olympic, in the last five years, it's gotten complicated. What is happening is, as the value of Olympic style China and silver, as the value goes up, you start to see more and more counterfeiting. Uh, what frequently happens is the counterfeiter, counterfeiter will get an authentic piece of silver from the period, and sometimes get patterns that magic but are not associated with White Star Line and they will have a laser printer burn uh, White Star Line and the logo into the silver. So you have to be aware of that. The second thing to keep in mind is that a lot of companies are jumping up and saying we supply Titanic with this, that, the other thing, and they can't prove it. So you have to be able, if you're going to get a reproduction, to try to get something that actually matches rather than just a fantasy piece. 
Now, for purchasing authentic china and silver from the Olympic, because you're not in the Northern Hemisphere, you're going to have to go through a dealer. The purser's locker is in the south of England, and they are a very reputable dealer in either memorabilia. In other words, if the purser locker says something is authentic, in my opinion, there's a 99.9% chance that it is authentic. You know, they're very sharp over there. Uh, the downside is you're going to be pay paying a very high premium because there was a time where in the 1980s, this all over the place and nobody wanted it. It was literally just stuff. And the prices were low. And now after the Jim Cameron movies come out and the Titanic ha now has uh, a monumental popularity, this stuff now is, is very expensive. And if you go through a dealer, you will be paying uh, the high end of the dollar. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sure. And uh, this, my second question is regarding artifacts as well. I know you felt touched about the little bottles of perfume. I remember that. Is there any artifact you would like to see or have and is out of your reach? The, I think, I have to think about this. Um, the one artifact I would really like to have is the fragment of marble from the first class smoking room fireplace. Ooh. Now I've got my computer to give me a picture of the marble so we actually can look at what we're talking about. Right. This is this is part of the egg and dart molding from yeah, there we go. This will work. Okay, can you see the marble? No. I see the dome. Oh, I see what the problem is. Okay, I cannot drag and drop it. Right. painting over the fireplace and the steward, steward came by and said, aren't you going to try for it, Mr. Andrews? I think that would be the, the one thing I would be most interested in. Has any of that been found? Yes. Um, I'll tell you what, <clears throat> before we lose the topic, let me throw it into my PowerPoint presentation. I can't just drop uh, the photograph into the screen. The computer doesn't recognize it, okay. uh, but it, it's it's loaded, so this should just take a second. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Let's see if we have any more comments or anything. <laughs> I see another, I see two yeah, more good questions. <clears throat> Barry Getz agrees that yes, she's seen a lot of um, counterfeit silver claiming to be from Olympic or White Star Line and it isn't. Um, she also says she remembers the marble and it was at Vegas for a while, a beautiful piece. Hmm. Um, All right, so I see two really good questions out here in the comments after we finish this, and then we can maybe get back to the presentation after that. Is that a model Titanic figure? Is that an honor glory model? 
Who am I? Yeah, you. You with the no, model. I got it, no, I got it off of um, eBay. It's a, it's a decent Titanic model. I'm still waiting for my Honor and Glory one. I think it's supposed to be coming in pretty soon. Awesome. I want to give a shout out to my um, Titanic Adventure Out of Time viewers. Um, I don't know if you guys realized it, but Bill um, contributed a little bit to Titanic Adventure Out of Time. Bill, we're streaming in um, my Titanic Adventure Out of Time group as well. Okay. Yay. <laughs> All right. Now, now Dibble here. Did you get it? Can you see the marble? It's yes Not, or no. No. <laughs> okay. We okay. Then we've we've chased this one far enough. Okay. You have to do the screen. You're not screen sharing yet, though. Uh, you, perhaps you can. Can you okay. send the, uh, this picture Let's, to you? Maybe we can show it through the camera. There you go. All right. Let's go ahead and just move on with this. Is that it right there? I have no idea. That's that's a something else. Okay. Okay. Um, um, did you want to answer these last two questions um, over there in yeah. the comments? Okay. So this is kind of related to that one. Michael Brady, uh, he said, um, is there an, okay, he was saying um, that he also recalls the perfume satchel that moved you a lot upon its recovery as it did me. Um, is there another artifact in particular that moved you um, on its recovery upon spotting no. it on the wreck? No. No, not really. Um, it was just the perfume uh, kind of gotcha. <laughs> the perfume bottles took me by surprise. Yeah. Because I was not expecting it. I don't have an emotional attachment to any of this stuff. It's like going through an antique gallery. And some of it's nice and some of it's okay. But it's all just stuff and it belongs to somebody else. Um, I don't have an emotional attachment to the Titanic or the accident or anything like that. So I don't interpret or react of, about this stuff in any way like that. You know, it's, it's like a, it's like a murder detective, you know, it's a tragedy, but you have to go home and leave your job back at the office. And so, you know, that's, that's basically it. Keep in mind, I'm basically an engineering type. Um, I don't like uh, a lot of florid emotionalism. It, it bothers me. Um, I'm very angry, by the way, that uh, I was unmasked in the in the Jim Cameron interview, but uh, it just it was a question I was not expecting, and I was not prepared to give a tanged answer. So Jim basically got something on film that should probably not have been released. All right. Well, we all have our moments. Yeah. Um, but the perfume, I think, would get to most anybody. That's quite something to, to behold, I'm sure. Um, Anthony Alcori has an interesting question. There seems to be some debate regarding whether the dome was backlit or not. We were just looking at a, at a picture of the dome. Um, I always understood it was the dragon vases being either from the lounge or personal passenger property. Has there been a conscious, has there been a consensus regarding those artifacts. I guess that's kind of two questions in one. So backlit okay, dome. Okay, can you rephrase or, them? I think. The first, okay, I yeah. just read all that together. So basically, he's saying was the dome backlit or not, and then the dragon vases from the lounge. Oh, the andirons. Yeah. Yeah. Were they were they from the lounge or were they personal property? This is from Anthony Akori. I don't remember bringing up uh, any dragons. Dragon bases. Hmm, Anthony, we may need some clarification on that one. Dragon bases. I don't know about that. 
Um, but what about the dome? I just remember, um, I remember recent, reading something about that recently too. I always thought it was kind of backlit as well, but. Well, the, the fact of the matter is in my book, uh, research is still ongoing. Uh, there's good documentation that the dome was actually edge lit. There was a gallery of lights uh, that showed up into the dome rather than backlit. Um, now, beyond that, I don't know. Uh, part of it is lack of good data. A lot of it is people have a tendency to take a supposition and then argue publicly what were a proven point. And that makes determining the truth, uh, or at least the facts in the case, very difficult because you have to now start engaging in hostile questioning that uh, does not go down well with the public. Well, how do you know that? People generally don't like that question no matter how well it's put. Um, personally for myself as a, as a research matter, uh, that goes into the passive research basket. There are some things that you just do not bother researching because you're looking for that needle in the haystack. What I'm waiting for is for something to show up that is proof positive. Now, I had hoped that I had found proof positive about 10 years ago. They were doing a lot of photography of the Mortania when the ship was being broken up. And they were taking the dome out of the Mortania's uh, smoking room. And I, I had really hoped when I saw this picture that I would be able to identify lights, you know, what the lighting pattern was. Unfortunately, when I looked at it very closely, I realized it didn't go anywhere. It was a dead lead. So eventually this will show up. And in the meantime, the best data is edge lighting. I do know that... Um, and this is not a primary source, but John Maxtone Graham, The Only Way to Cross, describes these glass domes as being very depressing at night because they were just blank black panels. Uh, John, I don't think traveled on Mauritania, but he is widely traveled enough that he probably was on board a number of smaller ships that were decorated in the, in the Edwardian style that survived uh, the Second World War. Uh, so I take his description seriously. Um, one last thing, and, and this is kind of a technicality. We tend to imagine ships being illuminated to the standards that we enjoy today, where bulbs are cheap and electricity is cheap and everything is lit with 100 watt bulbs, at least in the United States. And we just sort of assume that it's always been like that. You know, the average wattage for a bulb on Titan is between 40 and 60 watts. And while you do have a glut of bulbs in the dining room or in some of the public spaces, a lot of the areas of the ship just were not over illuminated like that. The, uh, the dome may be one of those things. That's very interesting. Thank you. Sure. Okay, back to the silver. Yeah, all right. Um, I'm gonna try and get through the rest of this quickly. Uh, I wanted to have a look at some of the silver that was carried on board. This is one of the more interesting pieces. Uh, this is a monumental soup tureen. <clears throat> Typically, the soups were placed on the, the sideboards. There are two monumental sideboards at either end of the first class dining room. Uh, that's where these were kept. Uh, when the waiter got the soup orders, he would go ahead and dispense from these. 
Um, you'll notice it's interesting because the basic body shape has this cove here and here. These are anti-slot shoulders to keep the soup in the bowl as it's being transported. Here we are looking down obliquely at it. Uh, this ruler is about six inches, so that'll give you a sense of scale. This is about a foot and a half long, and it carries uh, the reed and star pattern. Now, one of the reasons why this silver is so well preserved in the tureen is it resting up against a, um, a steam pipe, which is made out of iron. And as I mentioned, this mud has the pH of tomato juice. So what you wind up here is the mud will attack certain metals in a certain order. It's electronegativity. That's why you put zinc plates uh, on a ship around the propellers, because the zinc is a sacrifice piece, and it will decay first. Now, in this case, you have steel, silver, and a copper core. So in this triad of metals, the steel, the iron in the steel will decay first, um, and it winds up, <coughs> pardon me, saving uh, the silver and the copper, which go into the making of the, uh, the dream. Uh, here's the bottom. Here's the bottom of the piece. And you'll notice from the original photograph, this is the uh, this decayed area is the part that was in the mud, and then the silver area off to the right uh, was in the open ocean. Yeah, the single most interesting thing about this is it is a first class dining room piece, but it's stamped EM. Uh, that means engineer's mess. This particular tureen was assigned to the engineer's mess, which was run off the working alleyway on E deck. Um, they would have had similar markings for OM, that's the officer's mess, and then PM, which is purser's mess. Uh, the purser staff were the officers, and the deck officers, the engineer officers, and the pursers. Uh, all had the privilege of eating off uh, first or second class menus. Now, exactly how this worked on Titanic is not known, as far as I know. Uh, but in discussions with engineers from the Queen Mary from the 30s, if you were an engineer on the Queen Mary in the 30s, you had the option of eating off or second class. Typically, the engineers would eat off the second class menu. Uh, the food was close to what they would be serving at home, and it was far, far more practical. Um, the first class, you probably would order off that for a, uh, a birthday or something significant, and probably not the whole uh, eight course meal, whatever was being served that it would probably just be the highlights of the soup, the entree, the vegetable, and then whatever uh, followed up for dessert. Um, this is a piece that was heavily damaged. It's, it's heavily corroded, and you can see it's got uh, plastic stuffing in it to help it keep its shape. It's that far gone. Um, this is the only one that's been recovered. And this was a problem because there was so much wasting in the bottom because I'd never seen a photograph of it. Uh, I thought this could be coffee urn. This could be a water urn, or it just might be uh, an ice bucket. They did have ice buckets on board. Americans have always been crazy about ice. That goes back forever. Uh, certainly to the beginning of mechanical refrigeration. Uh, I originally thought that this might have been an ice bucket, but as it turns out, it's a coffee pot. Um, this picture is of the second class uh, sideboard 
And I didn't get a hold of this image until fairly recently, about five years ago. So, you know, I always remain uh, hopeful that something is going to turn up. At this stage of the research game, a lot of what we don't know is either never going to be known or it is in a single picture in the back of somebody's desk. And it's just a matter of time before those pictures uh, become available to a wider scholarship. This is an interesting piece in that it is uh, dual duty. A lot of the silverware at the time was required to do more than one job. Now, here you see this as a plate covering to keep insects off the food and to help keep it warm. A lot of times these lids are put in a warm closet that kept it warm at about 100 degrees, which is actually still comfortable to the touch. Um, and then it's put over the food, the food coasts. It'll stay warm for a good long time. Now, the dual purpose is it flips over and it now becomes a serving dish. So if you have side vegetables and not too many of them, they would probably be served in this inverted lid. This is a footed fruit bowl. And the reason why you know it's for fruit and not for something else is if you look very closely, um, this is called a gold wash. I'm thinking that the technical term is la may, but I'm not 100% sure. I should have looked it up. Point is that the silver on the Titanic was constructed at a time when gold wash was applied to the interior of anything that might suffer corrosion. Fruit is actually fairly acidic and it's hard on silver. That's why the interior of this bowl is plated and that's how you know it's a fruit bowl. Um, but this sort of thing disappeared in the 20s. People were losing in fancy, fancy stuff on the table and it was an expense and it could now be dispensed with because as I mentioned, the public was not quite as interested. This is also a good way to judge whether you have an early piece of silver or a post-World War I piece of silver. And here it is in profile. By the way, I should probably mention this is from the first class a la carte restaurant. You can tell that because of the arched scrolling and interlocking uh, leaf arrangements, floral arrangements right here. And here's the interior of the piece with the property stamp. This is a cute little piece and you don't see them very often. This is for making hot chocolate, which was a big deal at the turn of the century. Uh, drinking water was catch as catch can and a lot of people gravitated towards beer, chocolate, uh, less so coffee and tea because the beer and the chocolate had perceived uh, food value. I mentioned how things get demoted. Uh, this piece was originally from the a la carte restaurant on the Olympic. And by the time I got into the business, I used to be the curator on the Queen Mary in the 80s. This is a card from her uh, inventory while she was in Long Beach. And here you can see this exact same style of piece that was being used in first class on the Mary went hired. Glass and crystal ware. This is an unusual piece because it's actually made very cheaply. I think what's going on is this is some sort of saucer that would have been used under a sauce pot or something that posed a threat to the tablecloth. Um, it is actually rather cheaply made. Um, I believe those are machine cut glass in the middle. They also are not uniform. There's a lot of arch tolerances. So the piece, the pieces, when you stack them, you can see that they've actually got a lot of mechanical play. 
Now at the other end, you have uh, the glassware that's used in the, uh, this is from the first class dining room. Um, I, not sure if it's crystal, I just don't recall off the top of my head. But you'll notice that the cuts are fairly regular and not terribly elaborate. This is distinct from what you would see. Uh, uh, excuse me for scrolling all the way to the back. This is from the a la carte restaurant. You can tell because you'll notice you have very delicate scalloping at the edge. That all has to be done by hand. And then you have these elaborate cross cuts containing with them smaller cross cuts in the middle. And also, by the way, this is a very heavy piece and it is made out of crystal. It rings when you strike it. The sherry glass, probably the first class dining room. These are salt cellars. I mentioned them earlier when we were talking about third class. There's several different ways to dispense salt at a table. One of them is simply to put one of these little bowls in front of the diner and it's filled with, a, with salt and you simply apply it with your fingers. Uh, there's also a good chance that uh, you would use prepared mustard. Mustard, you can get different types on board the Titanic. Uh, you might request, in order to be sure that it's absolutely fresh, you would ask your waiter to have the galley prepared dry mustard for you and the mustard would be reconstituted and served up in one of these little bowls. Another bowl, this might be a finger bowl, this might be a bonbon bowl. At this stage, I don't know if we're ever going to know again. I'm hoping that one of these days, the, the manufacturer's catalog will show up and magically everything will have an identity. Uh, the last two pieces are uh, brownware and galley. These are all the matter of fact pieces that you would find in the galley. This is a first class bowl. It's uh, in essence what it all is, it's, uh, it's a ramekin. It's large for a ramekin. But these are French origin and they're made out of a special clay. And these are one of the few rare types of china that would be cooked in the galley and then presented the table. And then here at the bottom, um, it basically says porcelain, fire, fire, fireproof porcelain. Um, certain, uh, oh, fruit pies, things like that. The thing is it has to be cooked at a high temperature and then you cannot dig it out of what you've cooked it in, you destroy the dish. So this is, like I say, one of those rare things that goes straight from the oven onto, uh, onto the table. They are called brownware, you know, for obvious reasons. Uh, some of them are from the Titanic. Here, here, here. This one is actually a piece of passenger wear. Uh, somebody was transporting a teapot. There you have it. These pieces are unusual in that they seem to be for food that is cooked and then brought out to the table and then the brownware is taken back to the galley. In other words, these things are not left with passengers. Uh, there's a couple of things that make me think that this was also the coffee and tea set for um, the crew for officers, <clears throat> you know, where fine service is not required. <coughs> and of course, everybody, my, everybody's mind goes back to uh, Jim Cameron and his Titanic film, where it seems like everybody stands around and smiles and drinks tea. This piece is, is a water chiller. There was about a dozen, two dozen of these water chillers throughout the ship. Uh, some of them are from the galley. Some of them are from pantries, bars, 
there aren't too many self-service chillers. Um, here we are looking down into the kettle. I shouldn't call it a kettle, the chiller. And then they would circulate very, very cold brine water. Uh, salt water freezes below uh, fresh water. It's an excellent chilling medium so that this comes out of the tap frosty cold. And then here's the dispensing tap. And there would have been a piece of glass right here. So you could be sure that um, there was a proper amount of water in the cistern. I, I should probably mention, I, I should have thrown a picture in, uh, that fountain down in the uh, cooling room of the Turkish baths. That actually is not an ornamental fountain. That is a drinking fountain. And it is one of the very few self-service water fountains in first class. Uh, this was still the age of the public drinking cup. And if you go back and you look carefully at the photographs, you'll see that there are tumblers on either side. And the passenger was expected to turn a knob or press a button and this chilled water would flow out. And, you know, perhaps as a courtesy, you'd, you'd rinse the cup out for the next guy and it went back on the rack. And that's the way they did in 1812. This is a different beast. It's similar. This is a coffee or a tea or a hot milk urn. I think this is a hot milk urn. Now, they all look the same on the outside, but the mechanisms are all slightly different. Um, the reason why you have a, a hot milk urn is a lot of the protein-based drinks, uh, especially hot chocolate, it was not made with microwaved water. It was made with milk that had been brought boiling point. It's called scalding, but it isn't actually boiled. And then you mix the, uh, the coca preparation with the hot milk and now you have hot cocoa. Um, the reason why you have this sleeve, this urn, these have to be disassembled every night. Uh, hot milk leaves a protein scum that has to be taken care of the, the fact that the urn can be removed uh, greatly facilitates it because otherwise you're on a ladder climbing into one of these things and it's fairly large. Dishes. There are no automatic dishwashers on Titanic. It was all, all done by hand. And this is one of the dishwashing sinks. It's upside down, but you'll notice it's solid copper. And uh, the drain here and a strange fitment, which I'll go ahead and describe in a second. Here we are, we've flipped it over. Now we're looking down into the bottom of the sink. And this is the strange fitment that I was talking about. Flip it back over. This is what it looks like from the outside. The reason why I'm making such a big deal about this is you can't go into the Titanic British 1912 different civilization and start saying, oh, well, this must be this, this must be that. The, uh, this sink does not have access to hot water. How do you wash dishes without hot water? You fill it up and then you turn on steam. What this is, is a steam injector. so that these holes are now shooting about 100, uh, 212 uh, degree steam into it. And it does a couple of things. First of all, it brings the temperature up really high, really fast. The other thing is it agitates the dishes so that the bubbling steam will help knock that stuff off. Where it goes from here is a little difficult to say. I've seen American systems in which the, uh, the dishes are placed in kind of like a lawn swing and you rock it back and forth through a handle and the plates are moved, they're dragged through 
the hot water. You drain the hot water, uh, you give them one last rinse, and the temperature of the plates will dry them off. I don't know if they have that. Uh, it hasn't been any photographs. And because of the system, I only see in American uh, SIGs, same steam system, by the way. I, I'm reluctant to uh, just assume that it used exactly the same system uh, on Titanic. Uh, oh, by the way, you can tell that these are steam and not something else by having a very close look at the way the pipe is joined. These micro grooves and the, the porous, uh, the, the supple uh, gasket remains pretty much says, yeah, this is steam. This is not something else. Any questions about this stuff? Um, I think we've had some questions coming in here. I don't know if it's specifically about that. Let me see. Um, um, we did have a Titanic Adventure at a Time question. Um, I'll tell you what, I'll take that up. Mark okay. that question. I'll take it at the end. Okay, let's see. I don't think we had any about the silver. Hold on, I've got to go out and come back in. My um, my feed stopped working. Does anybody have any questions about the silver or the China? Any admin team members, guys? Just jump in here. Kipfer? Uh, I don't know about the uh, chamber pots, actually. Yeah. Um, were they embarrassed at all to use them? Or like, you know, or were that like, and just like at the time to where it, 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 it's like, it is what it is? That is a question that has too many complex variables. <laughs> <laughs> what is the gender of the person? How old are they? <laughs> who the companion is that is invoking modest. Um, I can tell you that a lot of people would not be too concerned. I will tell you that if you are reaching for a chamber pot for whatever use, it's an emergency. Uh, and a lot of that modesty sort of just disappears. Also, quite frankly, um, you know, occasionally you do wind up with strangers for travel companions. Um, the decency is, you know, if you're asleep, you stay asleep. If for some reason you're aware of this, as a demonstration of good faith to your traveling companion, who, by the way, is always going for the same sex. Mm -hmm. You roll over, you face the wall. It's just that simple. Uh, the Victorians, um, by Victorian, I really mean anybody before the second, First World War. It's uh, kind of an umbrella term. But they understood all of this. And the whole point of etiquette is to get through life without offending the other person. Um, I hope that adds the question. Um, it's really just, it, there are just too many variables to, to answer it. I'm... It kind of does. I mean, I don't know how they would do it back then. I couldn't, but... <laughs> Uh, I will remind you of something. Plumbing, did, private plumbing did not come in for a lot of people till World War II. And you lived with the reality of the commode. And that's simply what life was. Now, it's not that sort of attitude is not going to happen in first class. But maybe it would. I mean, look at Molly Brown. Do you think that she's really all that squeamish? She doesn't. Her legacy suggests she isn't. <laughs> so 
you know, that's why I, I keep going back. It just it just depends on the person. And I mean, I'll be honest. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I mean, honest, honest. I'm 60 years old. I was born in 1960, and I sort of alluded to this earlier. Um, I find that people today are modest to the point of irritating. Um, guys who don't take showers after uh, going to uh, playing football or stuff like that because they don't want to be seen disrobed. You know, my generation is close enough to 1912 to always say, what the hell is wrong with you? Just take your clothes off and go get a shower. And put clean clothes on because that's why the showers are there. Um, so I don't want to, I don't want to belabor the point, but there's a certain generational thing where, you know, you get up in the middle of the night, you need to urinate, and it's an emergency, and you're an old man, and you've done it five times this evening. You know, that's a very likely scenario. And, Bill, uh, what and you're traveling with somebody. If you, and if you're traveling with your wife, she's already seen the show 500 times. So there's, there's no wonder there. And if you're traveling with a buddy, he's either asleep or he'll turn around or he'll just keep his eyes closed. <laughs> Joanna's lost it. <laughs> I'm trying to keep it together. And besides, like I say, these what? things I, I suspect, there's nobody kept a diary, but I, I really suspect that these things uh, were used in case you had to throw up. I mean, that's, I think, really what they're there for. What I was going to say, though, was... That's um, wasn't it true, though, that for a lot of third-class passengers, um, indoor plumbing was a, was a luxury? It's something they didn't see very often. Um, so, you know. Yes, know. yeah, that's, that's quite true. Because, you know, this is, uh, this is still the era of the privy, where you walked out to a shed, and you did what you needed to do, and you came back in. Or... You used a commode, a, a, a bowl right. in the house where it was reasonably warm, and you took the night soil out in the morning. So that's, that's okay. where we were. That was the time period. It was a, you know, when I speak to classes at school, you know, I tell them, they're like, why is the Titanic so important? I was like, it was just such a pivotal moment in history. You're just in between so many different things. Um, and I, I try to tell them things. I don't always talk about that specifically. But anyway, moving on. Um, we do have some real questions here. Kipper, no more for you. You're done. Mute yourself now. Um, I had some real questions here. Oh, you guys need me lose them. Um, we had a question from... Um, Oh my gosh, what is wrong with my phone? From John Barris in, um, in Australia. He is trying to, um, okay. He said he has a question about plates. Bill, I'm running out of room in my cabinets, but wanted to get some replica plates. Was there a small, was there a small plates? Uh, were there small plates in all class designs, a la carte, dining room, second class, third class and all? Basically, I yes. think he wants to start collecting. Um, that's one pictures. of those. Good... So, go ahead. Well, whether you can find them in replicas, I do not know. But small side plates are a fairly standard feature because you need to have a place to put rolls. Rolls are almost always served with meals. And typically, they require their own plate. Uh, sometimes they use a larger side plate. Sometimes they actually use a small plate. But yeah, they are out there. He said he can't fit full size dinner plates, but small ones. I'm not selective. If I come across a piece, I just buy it. And so I have like mismatched stuff. It really irritates him when I show him pictures of my collection. Dave, um, <laughs> so done with you people. Dr. Gallo says, I'm 68 and I always travel with a chamber pot. I am done with y'all. Y'all stop with the chamber pot. <laughs> stop it. Dr. Gallo, that's enough. Um, Dr. Gallo, I will pay money for your chamber pot. <laughs> Indeed. I will be your chamber pot boy if you will just take me back to Titanic. <gasps> Sound good? Deal? 
I'm willing to buy a Titanic chamber pot if, or <laughs> Olympic chamber pot if I can find one. Oh my gosh, you got to stop it. Okay. <laughs> okay, I mean, I'm real... Sean Barris said, so there are five, mm -hmm. there would be like actual five China patterns that he would want to collect then if he was collecting China patterns. If you can find them, yeah. Five. <laughs> if you're going to collect them, you should have done this 20 years <laughs> when people could afford this stuff. <laughs> Steve, Sa Steve Santini, I think this was from, from a while ago, says, nice to hear you, Bill. Steve Stan Santini's been watching for a while. <laughs> oh, good. I gave you credit. <laughs> David Gallo says, ha, ha, ha. Oh, my God. I'm not even saying that on live. No. Dave, no. I'm not even saying that out loud. Bill, you can go back and read that in the comments later. No, I'm All not right. doing this. Um, John Wilton said, I'd buy a spittoon. Oh, my gosh. Y'all, I'm not even reading this stuff. Are y'all just saying stuff so that I'll read it out loud and just crack up? No, I'm not doing this. I'm trying to be professional here. Um, <clears throat> I think Dave is like literally commenting stuff so that I will say it without reading it first. And I'm not gonna do that anymore. Um, no more. Um, there was another good question out here. Uh, anyway, let's carry on. <laughs> Let's move Let's. on to navigation There's equipment, a, shall we? It's only a, a slide 128 of 204. <laughs> um, this is uh, obviously the front of the Titanic's bridge, the front of the deck house. And the arrow is pointing out the builder's plaque. And I got to tell you, in 2000, we were excited because uh, I think Ken Marshall went down and specifically went to get the plaque. And he brought this up and it was exciting, but it's something that really no one had thought of. This isn't the plaque, this is the backing plate. Here's the backing plate and then over it superimposed a Harlan and Wolf builder's black it hasn't been found uh, the wood was uh right where it should have been uh where the plaque is now nobody knows i think two separate um expeditions have gone down to look for it one was in 2000 and i think one was a jim cameron uh effort a few years later it's never turned up uh, we all think it's probably in the debris at the uh, on the deck. You know, maybe a new technology is needed, like a, an underwater vacuum cleaner. Uh, but it's been sifted through, and it's never turned up. This is a uh, a deck plan of the ship's bridge. Ship had a lot of steering wheels. Here we are looking at. Um, Olympic. This is the the navigating bridge. This is this is the the forward most uh, command set, and it has uh, this is called a steering standard. And basically, what it is, it's a dummy wheel, in that there's no real mechanism. It is simply a wheel with gearing on a stand. And you'll notice that there's a rod that goes up into a gear box and then it goes aft. Uh, here you can see the pieces. This is where the wheel goes. Here's where it bolts to the deck and this, this is goes up to this guy. And what it does is through this linkage system, just a second, here we go. Through this linkage system, it runs the telemotor which you see uh, in this drawing. Now this outer wheel is usually used while going in and out of port, mostly because of line of sight. The helmsman who's standing out there uh, can see the environment and he can hear his officers. 
and you don't have the problem of uh, a miscommunication. Once the ship has left port, uh, and especially if the weather was getting unfavorable, they would go into this inner cubby hole, which is the wheelhouse. Um, you'll notice that there isn't much of a view. You've got windows here <coughs> and windows here. And you wonder well, how on earth can you actually see out of all those windows? And the fact of the matter is uh, a helmsman is not a chauffeur. You know, there's no initiative on his part. He's told to steer a course until he's told to steer another course. So he doesn't need to see outside. All he really needs to see is his compass. This inner wheel is the uh, wheel that was actually used the night of the accident. And you'll notice that there are remains of the wood spokes right here at the top. Here's what it looks like in profile. It's just an A-frame. And this, by the way, is the Aquitania. It's an A-frame and then the, the shaft runs right through the binnacle and hooks up with the telemotor uh, in front of it. The compass itself has an electric light, but by law, all the telegraphs, all the binnacles must have um, kerosene lamps associated with them in case the, elect the electricity fails permanently, uh, the instruments are still illuminated. Telegraphs, there's a lot of telegraphs. Um, and now I'm irritated because I'm missing, my, my photos are all out of, uh, so you'll, I hope you'll forgive me as I hunt and peck for it, okay. Uh, there's, what, I think five telegraphs on the Titanic's bridge. This is not Titanic's bridge, but it is a better picture that I have available for what I want to show. Uh, the ones are for the main telegraphs. These go down to the starting platform in the bridge, and they have uh, engine, engine controls, engine orders on them. They, a lot of times I get questions, well, how can you tell them apart? Uh, they're actually all built a little differently. If it's a main engine telegraph, you'll notice you have this auxiliary third dial. This is called a telltale, and this is hooked into uh, the engine directly. There's the engine directly. And you can just make out a head, a stern, a head, a stern. What happens is these arrows move. If the ship is heading ahead, then the arrow is in the head position. If the ship is starting to move astern, the arrow flips to astern. This is, this is important when the ship is maneuvering because very often oh, between a head and a stern and because of the inertia, you cannot tell if you are moving a head or stern. These arrows basically guarantee to the officer that the ship is moving in the direction that he wants. Otherwise, you stand up there and you fret whether or not something has gone wrong and you don't know it yet. Now, you're, but now you start to issue a bunch of orders for an emergency that does not exist. The other way to tell these uh, telegraphs apart is to open them up. Each telegraph has a different, unique number of orders. And those orders are transmitted through this. It's called a star wheel. And basically, it's a gear, but it only has a limited number of teeth. If you count the number of spaces, the notches between those teeth, you will know the number of commands on the dial, even though the dial is long gone. And that way you can tell, OK, this is an engine telegraph. This is a maneuvering telegraph, whatever the question at hand might be. Okay, would you go ahead and assign me host uh, privileges, privileges so that we can go ahead and uh, do this?
Uh, one of the things, actually two of the things that we recovered were uh, the ship's log. Captain Smith's megaphone. There are two megaphones on Titanic. The bell is not marked in any way. So would that have been like shiny brass to begin with? Uh, perfume vial. 